each week we have, I have, sought to offer an apology. The theology of which Native American preacher Mark Charles speaks is a theology that much of my theological training has at best ignored or at worst perpetuated to Native persons, to Blacks, to other persons of color, who have been harmed by the systems of which I have been a part, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for my own participation in those systems. During my tenure at the National Education Association, with the exception of of one manager, most of my managers and directors were women and or persons of color. And for some reason, they thought that, that um, they could work with this guy from Texas who came into NEA as an ex-Baptist minister who for two years, three years, had to prove that he wasn't there as a plant from the religious political far right. They thought I could be educated further. And out of their patience, out of numerous uh, trainings, on cultural competency, on um, the insidious, um, unintentional bias that still operates around us in which we sometimes can find ourselves. That's all part of it. We've begun with this opening slide, Peter, the The target is not Christians, it's Christian nationalism. The target is not men, it's patriarchy and misogyny. The target is not white people, it's white supremacy. The target is not heterosexuals, it's homophobia. Don't take it personally join the work and dismantle oppressive system. Well, for some of us who have been on the receiving end of those oppressive systems, it's hard not to take it personally. But for some of us who are white, who haven't necessarily intentionally participated in those systems, um, we need to take it personally and ask, what is it we can do. One of the things the, the folks at NEA taught me was, Lee, you can't help being born white. You can't help being born in Texas. You can work on your accent, but the other stuff you can't, you can't deal with. And because you are white, and because you are a male, and because you are straight, you have all of the privileges and that uh, exist because of the system of whiteness that dominated our country. You have a responsibility. And through me, we who are white have a responsibility. From my perspective, perhaps the most significant damage we have done to the Christian faith is we have made Jesus in our image. White, 
straight. Some believe he was celibate. They can't prove that he was, and I can't prove that he wasn't. But there is a whole other understanding that Jesus may have had a familial relationship with Mary of Magdala. Got another slide I want you to see. This tends to present a, a different picture. And it's entitled, Just So We're Clear. Jesus wasn't white. He didn't speak English. He wasn't a Republican or a Democrat. He carried a cross, not a gun. The American flag is not a Christian symbol. The national anthem is not a worship song. The Bible doesn't say, God bless America. It says, for God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. The beauty of the story of the centurion's encounter with Jesus is the centurion is a powerful representative of the empire of the day. He's a centurion in the most powerful army on the face of the earth at the time of Jesus. He is an individual probably closer in color to many of us than we realize. From the empire's perspective, Jews like Jesus were troublemakers. They were causing unrest, mainly because the puppet rulers that Rome had allowed to exist in Israel didn't like troublemakers like Jesus. They thought him to be a zealot, and the zealots were always stirring up revolution. So the empire didn't have much, um, much appreciation for Jesus and his movement. But this centurion did. And this centurion goes to this troublemaker. And according to the writer of Matthew's gospel and those who wrote down Jesus' teachings from which Matthew and Luke take much of their gospel writing, the centurion calls him Lord. Here he is, a marginalized troublemaker from the empire's perspective. And the centurion cares about his servant enough to provide him health care. Now think about that. Cares about his servant enough to where he goes to this man who's from the empire's perspective a troublemaker but he knows him to be a healer and he says can you heal my servant jesus says sure i'll, I'll be right over and he says no 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 you don't need to do that a couple of reasons one apparently he knew enough about the jewish faith that um if jesus entered his house jesus would be considered unclean going into a Gentile's house. And then uh, he also said, look, I'm this person of authority. It's enough just for you to speak, and it'll be so. 
And so this one representing power and Rome and the empire demonstrates a faith and the love and the compassion and the ministry of Jesus that he says, you really don't even have to come. I just know that you can heal my servant. A marginalized, darker skinned Jewish trouble maker. Mark Charles, whose quote we read, is a Native American minister, pastor. I think he identifies as Navajo. And in the longer portion of the sermon explain, explains how actually the identity within um, many Native Americans is done through the mother's uh, tribes and not necessarily the father. He points out that one of the problems we have in Christianity in America today is we pick up and we read this, those of us who read it, as if it was written for us. Especially parts of the Old Testament. And he reminds us, no, the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures, as we would better call them, were written for the Hebrew people. It's the Hebrew people who are the promised people of God within our sacred texts. It's not Northern Europeans. It's not descendants of Northern Europeans. We're not even the focused recipients of what we call the Christian scriptures, the New Testament. Now, they apply to us. They provide guidance and leadership for us, yes. But we're the Gentiles. I mean, the first fight in the, the church after Jesus was crucified, buried, and raised from the grave and the resurrection took hold in that community was Peter wanted to require Gentiles to become good Jews first. And Gentile men didn't much appreciate that. And so Mark Charles points to the coming of the Spirit into the Gentiles as that's where we finally show up. We're an extension of the Gentiles, and yet we act like the Bible was written just for white Northern Europeans, and we interpret it often that way. When Winthrop, leading the some of the settlers of the of the colonizers, because as Charles points out, nobody discovered North America, it was already here, it was already populated, it was already civilized by native persons. But the doctrine of discovery that leads eventually to manifest destiny was this doctrine that said, if you're white and you have the power, you can come in and exert that power over people. That's where our understanding of white supremacy comes from. And in times of change, like we're in right now, when things are unsettled and people fear what's happening, some say we're going to make it right. We're going to fix the system. We're going to root out any study of what they label as critical race theory. It's 
State Board of Education in Oklahoma is downgrading the accreditation of the public school system in Tulsa because a teacher went to in-service training where she viewed training films on implicit bias. And it made her uncomfortable as a white female teacher. And Oklahoma had passed laws this last session saying such training was unacceptable, was a violation of law. And once again, we learn from history that we never learn from history. What did we find? Anybody grow up hearing about the, the destruction of Black Wall Street in Tulsa in 1921? I didn't learn about it. And I went all the way. I, took me until I was almost 31 to get out of school. And I didn't learn about it. Beth Roby Hyde's grandparents helped save blacks during that massacre. It's insidious. that after 400 years of nearly exterminating native peoples and replacing them with black slaves, we still haven't gotten over the original sin of America, of the United States of America, which is its punishment, conquering, slave-driven belief that somehow whites were entitled to such behavior. Winthrop's a model of Christian charity, a city upon a hill, saw the, the, the new world as a new opportunity to bring Christianity and to force it on the people. They couldn't do it by the power of the persuasion, they would do it at the point of a gun or a sword our spear. Heaven forbid that the spirit of God should move in women during the colonizing of the country. So what do you do? You burn them at the stake in the name of Jesus. All right, we know the problem. I'm, I'm preaching to the choir to some degree. And I get that. And because you are the choir, that's a part of what's right. There is still a testimony to a faith that says white supremacy is wrong. The manifest destiny is wrong, that the doctrine of discovery is wrong. We continue to damn white supremacy as antichrist, and we continue to be open to owning our own stuff. That's good. We challenge and we work to change unjust systems. When we put up on our 20th century sign out here, that black lives matter. We left it up for a little while, didn't we, Peter? And we'd see chalkings on the bench underneath the sign, all lives matter. And when that didn't get our attention, then they put it on the steps. And when that didn't get a, our attention, um, we finally, thanks to Peter and his his deep theological insights, he wrote a response to him, and we, played, we put that up on the sign. I don't know if they read it, but at least they didn't rip apart the sign and try to tear it up, right, Peter? 
we whites, and thankfully, this congregation is not all white. But we whites have a responsibility to go like the centurion to the marginalized among us and offer ourselves as allies in their struggles and seek their help in healing our nation. This week, an Alabama pastor, African American, was out watering his neighbor's flowers while they were gone on a trip. A neighbor, a white woman in the neighborhood saw a black man watering the flowers of another white neighbor's house. And since 9-11, we have always, we have taken to heart, if you see something, say something. Remember that coming out of 9-11? Well, now it's become if a white person sees a black person and doesn't like where they are and doesn't think they ought to be there and doesn't like what they're doing, they pick up the phone and they call the police. And I don't know what the name is for males who do that, but the name for white females is Karen, right? They're called Karen moments and they're being recorded. The bad news is the police came. The pastor identified himself, pointed to where he lived, and they wanted him to produce identity to prove it. And you can imagine where it went from there. Eventually, he's in handcuffs because now the offense is not watering the neighbor's flowers and being black. The offense is resisting the police. And he finally gives in to being handcuffed because he fears he'll be shot. He doesn't give in. The good news. The woman was watching what was going on, and when she finally recognized him, she realized what a mistake she had made. And she went and pled with the police to let him go. Unfortunately, they didn't let him go until after he was taken to the station and booked, and later the DA dropped charges. We all make mistakes. We all respond inappropriately at times. The progress that is being made in overcoming white supremacy is we're willing to own our mistakes that this woman did, and we're willing to call out the evil of white supremacy and how it tries to enforce a view of Christianity that's been flawed from the founding days or settling days of this country. And we, Wash Park, United Church of Christ, continue to stand for justice. We put up signs that say Black Lives Matter. We fly pride flags that say LGBTQ plus individuals are human beings created in the image of the divine and are welcomed here because of who they are, because of who where they are on life's journey. And we find that we're welcome here because of who we are and because of where we are on life's journey. And that's a powerful message to people who have felt cursed of the divine to hear that they are the blood.
May we continue to share that message. Let's pray. For the times we get it right, we give thanks for the work of your spirit in our hearts and lives. For the work of your spirit that enables us to speak justly, to love mercy, to care for persons marginalized by systems that have not yet been overcome. Thank you for our people of faith who understand that the heart of our faith is a call to care for the stranger, heal the sick, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to house the homeless, to work to make this day and life in our community, nation, and world. More like the kingdom of God. It's in your name we pray. Amen.